This is one of those videos that you're not gonna like what you hear, but you need to hear it. And if this video changes the lives of a couple of people that watch it, then it's a win for me, because this isn't the kind of stuff that people are excited to hear about. I'm talking about how alcohol doesn't just affect one night of sleep, but affects our circadian rhythm for a long period of time. We're also going to talk about how alcohol affects our glucose, which has other effects when it comes down to body composition. Outside of just late night eating because you're drunk, we're talking about real systemic changes here. So let's jump right in to a study that was published in the journal Chronobiology, and this looks specifically at melatonin. So we're gonna dive into this because it's a very interesting one. Now, before we get into that, I put a link down below for Thrive Market, they're today's video sponsor. So if you haven't already, check them out. They are an online membership-based grocery store. So what that means is you can go online, you can do your grocery shopping, it gets delivered to your doorstep, but the link below saves you 30% off your entire grocery order, plus gets you a free $50 gift. So I can't really say that more clearly. 30% off your entire grocery order. Even if you just try them out once, you never use it again, it's automatically a win. So use that link down below to get some groceries through Thrive Market. So this study looked at 10 days of controlled sleep, and then it had subjects go to a sleep lab for three days, and it had them consume alcohol, okay, or a placebo. This was really interesting because what they found is that 140 to 190 minutes post-alcohol consumption, there was a 19% decrease in melatonin. At first, you think that's really not that big of a deal. I'm just gonna chalk it up to a poor night of sleep with that. That's not the end of the world. And what's interesting is like, there's a few things that happen. For one, like you might think that when you drink, you knock yourself out and you're getting decent sleep, but most people know that's not the case. Two, you might think that, oh, I'm just getting one night of bad sleep. It's not the end of the world. But it's really neither of just those two, there's a third one. This disruption actually messes you up for days and days and weeks and months. Okay, now this is just 19% decrease in melatonin, which obviously is associated with keeping us asleep. But let's look at how it affects you further down the line. So this next study took a look at people consuming the average amount of alcohol that they would ordinarily consume, right? And they looked at them, they said, okay, if you consume alcohol between the hours of 7 p.m. and 7.45 p.m., just, just sipping on booze for 45 minutes, that led to a 41% decrease in melatonin production at midnight. So a 41% decrease while we're asleep absolutely affects how deep we get into the various stages of sleep. But they also found at 1 a.m. it was still suppressed 33% and at 2 a.m. it was suppressed 18%. So this continued on down the line. Now we ask ourselves like, why is this happening? And if we understand why, we can see how terrible it really is, right? Alcohol affects the pineal gland directly, okay? It affects it because of what are called adrenergic beta and alpha adrenergic receptors which are associated with adrenaline epinephrine. So when we drink, we have these increases in this, and that directly impacts the pineal gland, which directly impacts how we secrete melatonin. Now, studies are starting to suggest that this isn't just an acute thing. This is a chronic thing. It actually starts messing up the pineal gland, so it doesn't produce melatonin as well. So even when you're not drinking, you're not producing as much melatonin, you're not sleeping well. So we have to understand more pieces here because it's not just what's happening from the neck up, okay? There are other feedback loops that are happening systemically and this also equates to weight gain and some other issues that aren't so pleasant. So now we look at the idea behind glucose. Now we know when we consume a small amount of uh, like alcohol, we get a little spike in glucose. There's actually sort of a carbohydrate effect, but there's a very fine line between when you get the spike and when you drink so much that you actually get a drop. Now this drop can be quite aggressive and obviously a very scary problem for type one diabetics if they have that drop. What's really sketchy is there was a study that was published in Diabetologia that looked at this and they gave subjects alcohol or a placebo, okay, healthy people or diabetic people. And they made them euglycemic. And what that means is they made sure for 30 minutes they were all at the same blood sugar level of 80 milligrams per deciliter, okay? And then what they did is they gave them either alcohol or a placebo and they let them get all the way down to 45 milligrams per deciliter. So very clearly hypoglycemic. Okay, so you had people that were given alcohol or a placebo both at very low hypoglycemic, hypoglycemic levels. What they found was very interesting. Only 13% of people that were given the alcohol 
knew that they were hypoglycemic. Only 13% knew that they were down in the 40s with their blood sugar. Compare that to 73% that were given placebo were able to tell that they were hypoglycemic. What this tells us is that A, alcohol makes you hypoglycemic, but B, alcohol impairs your ability to understand that you're hypoglycemic, so you don't realize you're having this issue. That's a safety concern, but let's talk about real time here. People that aren't necessarily thinking about safety, they're just thinking about, well, how is this affecting my insulin and my sleep? Well, alcohol affects insulin. Alcohol actually promotes an insulin response. To a certain degree, yes, alcohol kind of acts like a pseudo carbohydrate in some ways, but that's really not the main piece. But what's weird is that it promotes this weird sort of blood redistribution in the pancreas from what's called the exocrine system into the endocrine system. Now this is basically blood that's on the outside area of the pancreas that migrates into the inside area of the pancreas and therefore causes an insulin release. This is called late phase insulin response. And a late phase insulin response is A, very dangerous because it's very hard to predict. Your body does this beautiful dance of you eat carbohydrates, insulin goes up, and it modulates to keep your blood sugar where it should be. Obviously dysregulated in diabetic people, but still the body is trying. When you have a late phase insulin response, there's no real rhyme or reason to it. Like why are you all of a sudden getting a spike in insulin even if there's no food in the system? Obviously it's gonna cause a blood sugar drop because insulin causes blood sugar to drop. Okay, well let's put this in the context of eating food for a minute too. Let's say you had a big meal bunch of carbohydrates and you had this big insulin spike. Okay, the insulin spike would normally come back down and everything would stabilize. But what if you had an extra insulin spike that happened after you already digested food? You can see how insulin being spiked constantly could impede fat loss because insulin is anti-lipolytic, meaning it stops lipolysis because it stops the fat burning process because it is a signal that there is food in the system. So yeah, this sucks for fat gain, but how does this equate to circadian rhythm and sleep? Insulin is a food cue. It is an environmental cue that tells us that we are awake. We are not spiking insulin generally if we're not eating. So if we're eating, we're spiking insulin, and if we're eating, we're awake. We're not eating when, well, some people eat when they're asleep, but generally we're not eating when we're asleep. So what this is doing is it's further instilling this messed up sleep system. You have suppression of melatonin, increases in insulin, every cue is telling your body it's awake even though you're not conscious. Now the other side, there's a really interesting piece. There was a study that took a look at over 2,600 men and over 900 women. Okay? And it looked at, of course, alcohol consumption just over their normal intake. And it followed them around for a while. And what they found with this was that there was a 3% increase in cortisol for every unit of alcohol consumed. Okay, so that means that you had some people that were having 15, 18% increases in cortisol. Researchers looked at the data and they said, interesting, these cortisol levels aren't going down the normal way they go down, with normal like rises in the morning and typical falls. They were falling at different rates, which is telling us that is isn't just an acute response to alcohol, it is a chronic response to alcohol, meaning that alcohol consumption could lead to chronically high levels of cortisol. More cortisol equals more muscle breakdown, it equals more fat storage alongside insulin being secreted in that late phase response, but also in addition to that, more visceral fat. Starting to connect dots, maybe that's why people that consume a lot of alcohol end up getting pot bellies. Maybe it's that visceral fat combination there, right? I don't know. And then lastly, the digestive piece. We know that alcohol is not necessarily good for digestion. We know we feel sick when we drink a lot. We know, yeah, obviously it's a poison. You're gonna feel sick, your body's gonna to try to reject too much of it. But what we're learning is that it's actually depleting pancreatic enzymes. There's some studies that are seeing this. The pancreas is having less trypsinogen. So this is a pancreatic enzyme that is very much associated with protein metabolism, protein breakdown. So we're altering our ability to break down protein. So A, we're messing up digestion, which is gonna cause fermentation and bloating and gas, and that's gonna mess up our sleep. But we're also not getting the protein that we need for adequate recovery either. And they're seeing this because they're actually finding that we're actually damaging cells. We're damaging cells in our gut that produce enzymes properly. So then we lose the ability to digest food over time. And studies, once again, are demonstrating that this isn't just acute, this is chronic damage to these acinar cells. These cells respond to food to help us digest that food. So now we're not digesting food properly, we're having proper or supposed malnutrition and improper assimilation, 
you see how this is a problem, but it also affects the gastric system and how we sleep because our circadian rhythm is directly tied in to our GI tract. So at the very least, keep your alcohol to one night a week to a couple glasses. And I know that's not what you want to hear. And I'm sorry, I don't have a sugar-coated way for you to get around this. That's just the way that it is. But I think the generation that is about my age and a little bit younger is probably starting to see the light that maybe alcohol isn't as cool as they once thought it is. I'll see you tomorrow.